All right, everybody, welcome back to IPAC for Petter's second talk. I wanted to mention that Petter has decided now to give five talks instead of four, just so he's not rushed. And the fifth talk will be a week from Tuesday. Okay, so go ahead, Petter. Thank you. So last time we started talking about <coughs> stable polynomial. <coughs> this week, my order. We started to talk about a stable polynomial, so I, I thought I'd, I'd just recap what we need for this lecture. So maybe the definition first. So, so from now on, we, we're gonna work with real stable, <coughs> real stable polynomials. So we have real coefficients. And a polynomial is real stable if it has, uh, well, real coefficients <coughs> and it's non-zero when, whenever all variables are in the upper half plane of the complex plane, the open upper half plane. So <clears throat> and an equivalent condition is that the, <clears throat> the univariate polynomials that you get from restricting through a line with positive slope is always rerouted. And this is, we will also use this uh, version of it today. <clears throat> and we proved that directional derivatives were always stable if we have non-negative coefficients. It could be that they're identically zero, but from now, now on we, we consider identically zero polynomials to be stable too. <clears throat> and we define, we, we identified a, a large class of uh, stable polynomials which are expressed as determinants. So they're given a, by pencils of matrices, where the first one, A0, is Hermitian, and the other ones are positive semi-definite. Okay. So then I thought I'd go to an example. Uh, Pierre, I think you, you did that last time. The number of matrices need not be the same as... Uh... I, I didn't uh, declare the degree here. <clears throat> okay, okay. So, yeah. So this example, I know at least uh, Jim is familiar with. It's the multivariate uh, Eulerian polynomials. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is sort of cute example of uh, how you may use multivariate stability to prove something easier and stronger. So if we have, so we look at permutations in the symmetric group of one through n, and we, we, we write the permutations in one line notation. And then we may look at the descent tops and the, and the ascent tops of the permutations. So note here that we look at the values and not the indices. So a descent top is just a number that is uh, is larger than uh, its successor in the permutation. And ascent tops are defined accordingly, but we have this convention that at the ends we have, we, we, we pad with zeros. So, so we can also have a descent top, um, I guess we have a descent bottom for the first letter. Uh, no, an ascent top for the first letter. Okay, <clears throat> and then we may form a, a multivariate homogeneous polynomial by just uh, taking these, this uh, generating polynomial for, for these two set statistics. <clears throat> okay, so what would, uh, well, so the first, what is A1 first? Well, well, we just have one permutation and this is, we pad them with zeros to both sides, so one is both an ascent top and um, yeah, it's a, it's a descent top since one is uh, greater than zero and it's an ascent top since, yeah. So here we have an ascent, here it serves as, as an ascent top and here is a descent top. So A1 is that just X1, Y1. And this is certainly a stable polynomial. And what we wanna do now is we wanna insert, so, so if we have a permutation, well, if we have the 
A permutation on n letters, we want to insert n plus one in that somewhere in the permutation. So we insert n plus one in a permutation sigma in SM and look at the effect of the polynomial. So <clears throat> what do we get? Well, so it might be, yeah, if we, if we insert, so if, if say sigma i and we insert, if we, if, if we insert m plus one in a descent, then uh, this, uh, then sigma i is a, and sigma is a, is a descent top and it gets destroyed by inserting, inserting in n plus one. And we get a new uh, ascent top, namely, uh, well, an ascent top, m plus one will be an ascent top and a descent top. So insert n plus one here. So what do we get? <clears throat> the effect is, <clears throat> So the effect is actually then, well, we, so we started with uh, X to the descent top of Sigma, Y to the ascent top of Sigma, and the effect on inserting M plus one, well, we destroyed this, this uh, ascent top Sigma I, and this we can denote by DD, X sigma I, right? And we created a new descent top and a new ascent top, namely M plus one. So we have X M plus one, Y M plus one here. So this is the effect of inserting M plus one in a permutation. It, it um, we differentiated the this monomial and by by this variable corresponding to uh, the descent top, and then we we multiplied by x n plus one, y n plus one. So this also works if if we instead have a, <clears throat> a descent uh, well a descent top. Uh, an ascent top, I mean, and so so we get the recursion a n plus one is x n plus one, y n plus one, and then we get the sum since we sum over all possible descent top and ascent tops because this is where we can insert our permutation, uh, our n plus one. So And then we apply this to a Okay. So then I maybe move this down a bit. So Petra, you want y sub i? It looks y like it. It looks like it. <laughs> it looks like a j, but it should be. An I. It should be an i, yeah. Right, because uh, you know. We can insert n plus one in any of the slots between letters or numbers. And each of these slots are either an ascent top or an, a descent top uh, or are sort of marked by descent top or ascent top. So this is the recursion that we get. What if you insert at the end? Then this is also the, in the end we have a, a so since we, we, we padded the permutation with zero, at the end, so we always, the last letter will always be a um, descent top. Mm -hmm. So this corresponds to padding it at the end or inserting n plus one to that. So this, uh, as we noted before, this is a directional derivative. This preserves 
stability and multiplying by, by monomials also preserves stability. So by induction, AN is stable. So of course, if, if we're just interested in the in the Eulerian polynomials, we, we get the Eulerian polynomial by just setting all the, the Y variables to one and all the collapse, all the X variables to a single variable, right? So this is the sort of, um, yeah, would exemplify the power of these, this going to multivariate stable polynomials instead. And there's been several extensions of this result due to Jim and Mirko, Vishon Tai and Jim and I and um, Mirko and, um, and Dave Wagner, but we won't talk too much. Well, we won't talk about that. So this gives a direct proof that the Eulerian polynomials are log concave, right? Because of yeah. that specialization. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Right. Okay. P Peter? Yes. Uh, if, if you, uh, I think you took uh, a special uh, directional derivative. If you have coefficients, does it behave the same way? If you have for the gradient? If you, if we have coefficients here? Yeah, with, with the derivatives. And yeah. like V1. Then we would get some maybe weighted Eulerian polynomial, I guess. Mm. But one would sort of understand it would be maybe difficult to, well, understand these weights, how they carry through the induction or the recursion. Mm -hmm. But you would certainly get something which you could combinatorially sort of try to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next example is an important example from when it comes to matrix theory. So, so now we, we're given a, a, just a matrix uh, with complex uh, entries, and we, we assume that it has full rank. And now we can form a a stable polynomials out of this. What do we do with we form? Let f now be the determ a determinantal polynomial. So we just take, in this case, okay, sorry. We take rank one matrices. And we have n of these. Right? So we know that this is a stable polynomial, as we discussed before. Since, uh, since these matrices here are positive semi-definite and rank one. So one can, we will see that this is going to be a multi-affine polynomial. So each variable occurs at most of the first power. But we can write, we can be use, use some matrix yoga and write F as, well, it's not hard to see that this is going to be uh, the determinant of A times some diagonal matrix, times a diagonal matrix of variables. times the transpose, well, the permission, the conjugate of A. And if we have a determinant of a product of matrices, then we have the, this cauchy binet theorem that lets us expand this. And what do we get? Well, we get a subset, sum overall, subsets of S where the size is R 
this, this is going to be oops. this is the size of the matrices and uh, what we get is by Kurfi Binet is we get the determinant of the sub matrix lying in rows S and uh, columns S. So this is the sub matrix lying in rows and columns S. And then we get the determinant. conjugate so and then from the diagonal we get xi i in s so this is a nice um, polynomial web because it's you see the support of f so the support of the polynomial is the, the set for which the coefficient is non-zero. So it's all the S's for which the coefficient, corresponding coefficient is, well, coefficient of S, I guess. Is non-zero. So what is this? Well, this, is, this happens exactly when when this is uh, non-singular, right? And this is exactly when the corresponding vectors span the space. So, or, or when it's a basis of the, of CN, or CR. So this is, oh yeah. So this is the set of bases Of, of the matroid, of the linear matroid, defined by, by the vectors. Okay. I think you meant to say uh, coefficients of the product of the xi's, right? Well, no, the support of the polynomials, I, I mean the, the, so I define it as the ind indices, well, the index set in this, uh, in this case, for which the, 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 uh, the coefficient is non-zero. And the coefficient is non-zero if and only if, of course, the, this ma submatrix is non-singular, and this is non-zero if and only if the, well, the corresponding vectors um, is sorry, I made a mistake actually. No? So this should be R here, I guess, right? We should look at the full. If we do this right. <clears throat> so, so from from uh, this stable polynomial, we can read off the set of bases of the linear matrix uh, matroid defined by these vectors. And this is not sort of a coincidence that you can that you that you get sort of as a support a matroid. And so, a theorem by Cho, Choi, Oxley, Sokol, and Wagner says that this is always true, that uh, whenever you have a multi-affine, as this, uh, well, a multi-affine homogeneous and stable polynomial, then the support is always a set of bases of a matroid. But this example then shows that all linear matroids over C uh, can be realized by uh, by a stable polynomial. And this will be 
this is an so Petra just to make sure everything the i's are dotted the t's are crossed you want a to be an r by n matrix right not an n by r matrix and therefore you want the v's to be the row vectors oh sorry yeah so we have r yeah r by n and then the v's are, are should be for the rows not for the columns Right, because you've got MVs. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Right. So we should, should switch these. Take the transpose. Yeah. Uh, hi, excuse me. Well, uh, with that result, you cited about the support of the uh, of the polynomial always being the bases of a matroid. Is the result that uh it could it could be an arbitrary matroid or is it that the, uh, it's a representable matroid so this is a a question that so so we, we can so by this example all linear matrices over c can be realized as the uh, as, as the support of a stable polynomial but uh, there are there are uh, matroids that are not realizable in this way for example, the Fano matroid, one can prove. And yeah, but we'll talk about this more in a while. But yeah, so, so maybe, yeah, so maybe I should just to avoid confusion later, we should just, uh, should just write this lying in. In, in rows, yes, I guess. Okay. So to, to move into uh, Lorentzian polynomials, we need to understand what, how ho homogeneous stable quadratics looks, look like. And this is because, well, Lorentzian homogeneous, well, Lorentzian quadratics are the same as homogeneous stable quadratics. So, and in order to do this, we just recall two, um, two well-known theorems from linear algebra. And the first one is Sylvester's law of inertia. And this says that uh, for a real symmetric n by n matrix, then the signature uh, stays the same if you, um, yeah, if you conjugate by a, a, a non-singular matrix. So if we take P transpose AP, then this has the same sig signature as A for any uh, non-singular P. And this is not hard to see. You can just argue as, of course, the, one can argue that the, the, well, one way of proving this is just to, to see that the kernel of the matrices are preserved and then, then by some cont continuity argument, you, you can prove this easily. And the other one is uh, Cauchy interlacing. And this says that the, if, we, if we look at a real symmetric n by n matrix again, and we take some, look at some principal uh, submatrix. So we, and n minus one times n minus one, I guess, then did I? Yeah. So, so then uh, this, this the, the eigenvalues of the submatrix will interlace those of the original matrix. And by interlacing, I mean this relationship that the eigenvalues of the submatrix lie in between consecutive ones. Okay. So what I want to prove now is, uh, well, so for quadratics, homogeneous quadratics, we can always write, so, so any, so now, so any homogeneous quadratic may of course be written, uh, maybe be written as a matrix, or we may write this as F equals sum ij, aij, xi, xj, right? So this is 
x transpose ax. Where now a, a is essentially the, the Hessian. Well, it's uh, half the Hessian. So it's half the matrix di dj f where ij equals one two. and this is we denote this by the hessian okay so we want to what we want to see is what what conditions what conditions on a guarantees f to be stable and the following proposition then is what we're going to prove. So, so we write F in this way, where A now is asymmetric, uh, N by N matrix with non negative coefficients. And then I, I claim that the following are, are equivalent. So the first one is then uh, that A has exactly one positive eigenvalue. And this, is, this condition is, is what defines Lorentzian polynomials that we want to look at at matrices with exactly one positive argument. So the second one is that F is stable and non-zero. So it should not be identically zero. And the third one is a sort of some kind of correlation inequality or log concavity maybe. And this should hold for all, for all E's in with positive coefficients and, and any X in R. And the, the fourth one is sort of the same, the same inequality, but for, for some, just for some E in Rn, for which uh, such that E transpose AE is, is greater than zero and all. X in order. Okay. Peter, in the first condition, you say positive eigenvalue, but it's possible you can have zero eigenvalue. Yeah, it's allowed to have. A, it's allowed to be non sing. It's allowed to be singular, so okay. it's allowed to have zero as an eigenvalue too. Okay. So it's not exactly the Lorentzian signature because we allow for for zero to be an eigenvalue. So it could so it could have some large kernel, and it, typically it will in our examples later. Okay, so this is yeah. So we're already seeing one equivalence. So first, so if we write f of uh, t times e minus x, you recall that stability is equivalent to that. This polynomial has only real zeros. So yeah, we take now in E and E with positive coefficients. Then if we expand this, what, what, what will we get? Well, this is T E minus X transpose A 
te minus minus x. So if we expand this correctly, we get t squared e transpose a x minus 2t, sorry, should be an e there. And then e transpose a x, we get two of those since we have a symmetric matrix. Right? And then um, plus x transpose a x. And as we saw, this is stable. This is stable if and only if um, if the the discriminant is is uh, non-negative, right? So this is if and only if e transpose a x squared is greater than. So this shows, so this proves the equivalence of two and three, right? So now, so now we know that two and three are equivalent and then we show that the rest of them are equivalent by some a chain of, of implications. So we first prove one implies two, And how do we do with that? Well, we need to prove this. Yeah, well, one implies three, I guess, but this is equivalent. So we want to prove this. Uh, so we assume now that A has exactly one positive eigenvalue and we want to prove this statement. And uh, so, so we take what we do, we take, we take E in with positive coefficients and then, and yeah, X in R. And if, if E is parallel to X, I'll write it in this way, then, then this three is obvious, right? Then we have equality there. Because, well, yeah. Then, so, so we assume not, so we assume, assume that E is not parallel to X. But then we can extend, then we can extend two bases. So we did, we have a basis, so we extend to a basis say well, so we get a so we get a a, a um, non singular matrix with uh, say we with first and first vector e and then x and then some some new vectors. B3 to Bn. So this is then some non singular matrix. And now we want to apply Sylvester's criterion. So Sylvester said that uh, under conjugation, uh, the signature doesn't change under conjugation. So we, so we know then that. Uh, so we know by Sylvester implies that this matrix P transpose P, which if we, okay, if we write that out, we know our linear algebra, we can write the, the entries of this matrix and we will get E transpose A X as the top left entry. And then we have E, uh, no, we won't, right? 
E transpose A E, uh -huh. E transpose A X, and then X transpose A E, but we can write this as E transpose A X, and then X transpose A X, and then we, we're not interested in the other entries. Right? So this has, has at most one positive. Well, it has exactly one positive. And now we come, now we can, so, so the, so we have, so we have one positive eigenvalue and maybe one zero eigenvalue, but the rest of them are, are negative. <clears throat> so uh, what can we say about this submatrix here? So we use this Cauchy interlacing now, and we, if we, if we, use it once, then, you know, the zeros will be here. If we use it twice, we can see that we, we must have, all the way, we must have at most one positive eigenvalue. So if we use Cauchy interlacing several times down to, so that we get down to two by two matrix, says that the matrix, yeah, do I wanna write this again? So this uh, two by two matrix has at most one positive argument. Can we say exactly or? Yes, we can because because E transpose because this is positive, right? By assumption, we deduce that. Okay. Yeah, but maybe I proved the, um, maybe I wanted to prove one implies, or two implies four. Let me just think for two seconds. No, sorry. Yeah, because, because this uh, top entry is positive, but this matrix cannot be negative semi-definite. Which would, which would be the case if all were non-negative and non-positive, right? So if we call this matrix B, so because this top entry is, is positive, we have, uh, for example, E1 transpose B, E1 is positive. So, so B is not a negative semi-definite. So it has a positive, so it, it has a positive. Has exactly one positive. And you know, and now you probably know where to go. So since 
since it has at most one positive eigenvalue, well, the determinant has to be non-positive. So, so hence, the determinant of B is non-positive. And if we write this, this is, this is exactly what we want. So this has got to be less than or equal to uh, E transpose AX squared. Okay, so this proves one implies three. And of course, uh, three implies four trivially, right? Because uh, if it holds for all, then it, it holds for some. Right? So three implies four trivially. So we need, so we, we're left with four implies one. And one was, A has exactly one positive argument. <clears throat> So how do we do that? Well, it's not too hard. So we assume, we assume this uh, four, namely that, that we have this, we have this vector E transpose A E is greater than zero, and we have this uh, E transpose AX squared is greater or equal to. Okay. So now we want to deduce that, that uh, the matrix has exactly one positive eigenvalue. And how do we do that? Well, we look at some hyperplane. We look at this hyperplane X in Rn for which E transpose AX is zero. So we look at the half, half plane where, where we have, whoops, where we have, uh, where this is zero. But since E transpose A is positive, this means that on, on that half plane, the matrix has to be negative semi-definite, right? So then, then A restricted to H is negative semi-definite. So it has no positive eigenvalue there. So was so now again we we you know we may use so 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 by 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 Sylvester we we may well we may take a basis we we may take a basis for H and then uh, extend it to a basis of the whole space and uh, if we look at the matrix A in that basis. This means this Cauchy interlacing says that uh, A has at most one positive eigenvalue, right? Because this, this matrix restricted to H is, is a principal minor, a principal submatrix of A in, the, in that basis. So, so again, by, by Cauchy interlacing and Sylvester, by ch changing the basis, we see that A has at most one positive argument. And since, since for example, well, E transpose AE is greater than zero, 
it has some positive eigenvalue. It cannot be negative semi-definite. So it it has it has a positive eigenvalue. And I guess this is this is it. So then, but this theorem then or proposition it it gives us some tool to, tools to prove well first to prove that a that a quadratic is uh, stable but it also introduces this uh, lorentzian signature that we we have matrices that have it have exactly one positive argument okay uh, peter in, yes. in 3 and 4 it's minor but you can replace you can work with x on the unit ball uh, sure yeah it doesn't change you can actually work with x in the positive author too or x in any um open code but that's not too important okay so now i want to go into uh, matrix theory and m convexity because this is also what we need for uh, for the uh, lorentzian polynomials so we define what we mean by an m convex set now so maybe i should start a new page but i cannot see the pages Speed. well never mind So an M convex sets, they are, go by many names. They are sometimes called it polymatroids. And uh, nowadays, popularly, they're called integer points of generalized permutahedra. So these are all synonyms. <clears throat> so what is the definition? So so we have some some collection which we called so M now is a finite subset. of integer of the integer vector so subset of c to the n so then m is called is called m convex if the following axiom is holds so it's the exchange axiom and it, you should think about the exchange axiom for the basis exchange axiom for matroids. So what it says is that for any pair alpha and beta in M, such that in some coordinate, uh, and if we have some coordinate where alpha is greater than beta, then we should be able to find another coordinate where we have the opposite, so beta j is greater than alpha j. And the important thing is that we can subtract uh, the basis, standard basis vector index by i, and then add the one for j and get into m again. So you recall this from matroid theory. So one way of sort of visualizing this is say that we have alpha here and beta here. And then we have some coordinate where in, in this example we have, here we have alpha 
minus e i, right? And then we should find some some coordinate where beta is greater than alpha, and then we this is and this should be in the set again. So if this is in M and this is in M, then we can move in this way to, to get into M again. And the reason for why this is, well, there are several reasons for why this is called, is a notion of convexity, but one way of seeing is, is then that we can continue this process now to get a, to get a, such a path from alpha to beta, right? And it's almost a straight line. And the, the fundamental example is now when, so. When Peter, is it symmetric? Uh, can you go down from beta to alpha this way too? Mm -hmm. You can. So there are different ways of defining um, M convexity, but this is one way, but we could start with uh, beta instead. And there's actually a symmetric, uh, exchange axiom two, which is equivalent. But so example, if, if M is, has only coordinates zero and one, then, then, um, then M is, is M convex, if and only if M is the set of bases of it. And this is just because this is this this is the basis exchange axiom in, in that set. <clears throat> gotcha. So yep. this in the general case, do you also get that all the vectors in M have got to have the same sum? Yeah. Towards? Yeah. Okay. You get that directly here, right? Exactly. Yeah. That, I'm just checking that I was understanding. <laughs> because you can get go from alpha to beta. In exactly. And without changing the sum. Tak skal du ha. Varsågod. So, and uh, you want this to be in the whole set of uh, integers or so, and so, natural numbers? So for our examples, uh, for our example, we, we, we're just interested in uh, when it's the natural numbers, but, but it, this uh, notion is translation invariant. So we can always assume that it, they're among the natural numbers. So we can always translate by some constant vector. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, uh, so what's the now, the connection to polynomials? So if, um, if F, is now a polynomial. So now we have the natural numbers and we write it in, in this way, but where this is vector notation. So it's, so then the support, support of F is as with the case that we, considered before. So it's all the alphas such that A of alpha is non-zero. So for from polynomials, we can then go to, to set systems by taking the support. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna, so, so in an analogy with the, um, with the matroids, we, we may, we may uh, con we, we may construct the contractions and the um, and the truncations. So so if oh, so if if I is in N, we may contract and and we have some set system. We we just take. Okay.
So now, Tedder's re re remark was actually. So actually, for, for our case, we would, for, for the next things to make sense, we can actually assume, we'll, we, we'll assume that our. That our um, that our m convex sets live in the non-negative 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 integers to them because otherwise this wouldn't make sense. Okay, sorry. So the this is the contraction. So we take alpha minus e i where alpha is in M and alpha I is strictly greater than zero. Because otherwise it, yeah, it wouldn't make sense that if we would allow for, for any, for integers. So this, we call this the contraction. And uh, we also have the truncation. And this is just the union of all the contractions. And this is in analogy with the matrix theory. This is how you would define them. And of course, if, uh, um, if these, And they, these rhyme well with, uh, so if we have these A of alphas in the, which are the coefficients of F, if they are non-zero then, then, then uh, these um, operations rhyme well with operations on polynomials because the support now of, of the derivative of F is now gonna be the contraction of the support. And the truncation, well, the support, the support of the directional derivative where we have positive coefficients. So V is positive coefficients. Then the support of the directional derivative is the truncation. So this is the truncation of the support of that. Right? And now I wanna end with a, a lemma that, just stating the lemma, which um, I won't prove because I have a proof of this, but it's not very enlightening, uh, enlightening so I don't wanna spoil this for you. So, I'll, so maybe you could come up with a better proof. So suppose now that we have some set system M and that say the size of alpha is greater than two for some. So it's not yeah, for some alpha in it. Okay. So it, it's sort of a rank greater than two, this set system. You can think of this, even in the case of matroids, I've not seen this lemma before, but it's, it's gonna be important for us. So if we have this, uh, some set system just, and if we know that the, the contractions of M are M convex, for all i, and uh, the truncation of m is m convex. So just these, that the, the, the contractions and the, the truncations are, or, and the truncation is m convex, then actually, then m is itself m convex.
Petra, I, I missed the definition of absolute value of alpha. So, well, okay. So it's just the sum over of all the coordinates. Sum of the coefficients, okay, great. Peter, in your definition of uh, contraction, you want alpha i more than one or not? Uh, contraction. Just a minute. So the contraction, oh, no, zero. Hmm. Because in the case of uh, matroids, we when we contract, we don't care about that vertex, that uh, element anymore, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so this uh, I have. If you have seen this, well, if, if you just think about matroids, so if you have some uh, say some set set system for of say rank greater than two, so so meaning that they're homogeneous. So all, all the sizes of the sets are the same, and that size is greater than or equal to three. If, if we know that all the contractions are M convex, oh, are our set of bases of matroids, and all the all the um, truncations are set of bases of matroids, then M itself is the set of bases of matroids. Is it reversible? Is M convex the con the contraction is M convex? Yes. So that yeah, I should have. So yeah, I took that for granted. But it's very easy to see that. So the yeah. So maybe I should. Uh, yeah, I should definitely. Thank you. That's a important point. That didn't. So the converse is. Is, uh, is true, right? And it, it's easy to prove that if, uh, if uh, M is M convex, then so is so are So are the contractions and, and truncations. And this lemma is a converse to that, that <clears throat> actually describes the, the M convex sets. But yeah, but using this lemma, it's gonna be easy for us to see that the supports of all stable, pol stable homogeneous polynomials are M convex, but we'll leave that until next time. So, so we are already sort of set up for the uh, for the Lorentzian polynomial since uh, we were dealt with the important case of quadratic Lorentzian polynomials, which are the same as as um, stable uh, quadratic stable polynomials, and we also set up for the sort of the connection to M convexity. So next time we're gonna yeah, dwell in more into that. <clears throat> okay, okay. Well, let's uh, thank Petter for a beautiful talk. Yay. Uh, any questions? Guess we've already had a lot of questions as we went along. Okay, mm -hmm. well I want oh I have ahead. one. So yeah. Um, is these like M convex concept related to um, the uh, matroid polytope, like the polytope con construct by the basis of the uh, matroid? Uh, well, it's well, when the definition is like this, it's uh, more related to. Um, to the set of bases of a matroid, but you, as I told you, you, you can define it in very different, many different ways. And so they are equivalently, these are generalized permitahedra if you look at it in another way, sort of, or they are polymatroids if you look at it in another way. So 
So they, they are also, a, you may define them as a generalization of the base um, uh, polytope too. So there are different ways of, of defining them. So, so what I hope for is that someone comes up with a conceptual proof of this for, for the different definitions of a matrix. Because now it, it's not hard to prove, but it's, uh, I don't see sort of the, the gist of it or the real reason why. Right. Every, so, so this says something that, you know, in defining a matroid, everything that is, is important is in rank two, in some sense. Okay. Thank you. Ooh. Other questions? No? Okay, well, have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you on Tuesday. Yeah, see you.